In 2002, Pierce Bronson returned for his final outing as 007 in the 20th film of the franchise. Directed by Lee Tamahori, this time, James Bond is captured behind enemy lines in North Korea, but is exchanged at the DMZ for the diabolical Zhao. Instead of recovering and debriefing, Bond disobeys orders, goes rogue, and eventually crosses paths with NSA agent Jinx, played by Halle Berry. Together, they team up to take on Zhao and uncover one of the zaniest villain plots yet in Die Another Day. Good evening, 003. The following is for your ears only and is classified above top secret by Her Majesty's Secret Service. Our contact with the We Can Make This Work, probably, podcast network intercepted an encrypted audio message regarding podcasters assembled. For this season, the podcast network is looking to recruit field operatives from around the world to reminisce about the Bond movies and a countdown to the latest film in the franchise, No Time to Die. Your primary objective is to infiltrate podcasters assembled by recording and uploading your submissions at probablywork.com. Utilizing a two-way communications device with a built-in microphone, the latest from QBranch. For a full mission report, go to probablywork.com. We're all counting on you, 003. Podcasters, assemble! This is Troidal Power from the Power Playthroughs Podcast. Hello, my name is Ben Thompson. I am from badassoftheweek.com. Yo, this is Corey Torgerson from the upcoming podcast, The World is My Burrito. This is Chris from the Comic Zombie Podcast. Eric Slater here from Epic Fails of History and Too Young for this trek. Hi, this is Justin Aki, graphic designer and one half of Significant Otter Co. This is Megan, the other half of Significant Otter Co. My name is Bill, and I am from Bill's JRPG Adventures and Other Trappings podcast, and from the RPG After Years podcast. And from the Tarviran, a Wheel of Time podcast. And from the Coordinate, an Attack on Titan podcast. Oh, and um, what's the Hit It Till They Dies podcast? Uh, yeah, the one with Troy. Uh, yeah, I'm on a buttload of podcasts. And today, we are talking about... Die Another Day. Die Another Day. 2002's Die Another Day. Die Another Day is the 20th James Bond movie. It is the 20th Bond movie and the fourth starring Pierce Brosnan. Today we're going to talk about the fourth installment of the Pierce Brosnan James Bond films and the last to star Pierce Bronson as 007. The film is an original storyline but contains a number of references to the franchise's history. Uh, I think we can all agree is, uh, to put it kindly, the least watchable? Let me make something very clear. This is a fuck terrible movie boy this is a sloppy mess of a james bond movie isn't it this is the result of someone setting trash on fire that trash looking at itself in the mirror realizing it has every right to be unloved then setting itself on fire again so james bond piers brosnand 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 that's that's your fault eric you keep saying brosnand <laughs> makes me think of that australian serial killer who's in prison brosnan <laughs> uh yeah piers brosnan um <laughs> it's, uh, it's his final outing as James Bond. Just don't know where I was going now. And yeah, here we are at the very end. And we had a very good start with Goldeneye. We had a, a decent film in uh, The World Is Not Enough. No, uh, Tomorrow Never Dines. And then a sub-average film in The World Is Not Enough. Uh, although I did have Denise Richards in, so, you know, <laughs> young Bill can't complain. Uh, and then we now have Die Another Day. I mean, after the last Pierce Brosnan movie... I wasn't super hopeful, and I remember this one being really ridiculous. It straight up is terrible. It's really bad. And and it was, but honestly, it was fun at the same time. Like, the last movie was kind of boring. This one's just buck wild. I don't know what they were thinking. Last I left off with the podcast, I was just hoping that this last Pierce Brosnan movie ended on a high note. Something less forgettable than the last two duds. This movie is the opposite of The World Was Not Enough. It's still not good, but it's like they saw the people didn't like the emotional and talky scenes in the last movie, and they're like, fine, non-stop action, even if it doesn't make sense. I'm here to report back that this movie was horrible. However, this movie does do some very unique things for the Bond franchise, so I'm not going to rag on it the entire time. Now, I only ever managed, when I was younger, to watch probably about 20 minutes of this film, I think. 
Um, I didn't remember Halle Berry was in it at all. So <laughs> there's that to say. There are actually the bones of a really good Bond movie in this in this mess. Um, all I remember about this film from watching it the first time was some terrible, terrible surfing scene, which was just completely unbelievable. Fortunately, that's where the, the positives kind of end. And um, there was a bad guy who I think might have been Richard E. Grant, which seems like a very bad choice to be a bad guy or it's just some bloke who maybe looks a little bit like Richard Egon probably looks nothing like Richard E. Grant who knows it's just yeah I just remember watching about 20 minutes of this film when it was on TV you know you've got a good guy playing Bond and I don't think anyone's going to complain about Brosnan although there's not a lot for him to do in this one as far as the material to work with I tried to follow the normal format of the show but I just came up with a list because I this movie just had too much of everything you know, you've got some cool action scenes, some some interesting characters on the surface that we just you know never really get to delve into, or what they're given to do is a bunch of shitty one-liners and just cheesy nonsense. There's too many locations. We have North Korea, Hong Kong, Cuba, London, Iceland. They're in the water. They're in the sky. They're on land. They're on ice. <sighs> just wanted to let you know where we stood. I've actually never seen this one before. I honestly forgot there were actually four Brosnan movies until we started doing this uh, this series. I seem to remember there being some terrible, terrible CGI. And I was just like, nah, do you know what? I can't even bother to watch this. And it is, to this day, the only Bond film I have not watched in its entirety. Until now. Now I'm going to watch this film and I'm going to tell you all about it. Um, And so... I've never seen it before. I'm kind of excited about it. So let's see what it's all about. We're off to kind of a bad start right off the bat. Was it necessary to show the bullet entering the gun in the opening targeting scene? No. We open with the gun barrel sequence and the bullet that Bond shoots goes up through the barrel of the barrel that we're looking out of. Um, you know, the perspective of this is supposed to be looking down a gun barrel at James Bond, but he pulls the gun and shoots you first. Th- this would imply that he shoots directly into the barrel that is pointing at him. I kind of like what they were trying with the bullet effect. I don't know. Something about it's weird and jarring. And maybe the CG is wrong. Something's not right. And it puts it's like, uh oh, something new, though. This whole cold open isn't that bad. Like, it's better than I remember it being. Ah, f*** me, the surfing scene's the first bit in the film. We open in North Korea, and already what they're doing here is filming something called Day for Night, which is when you film during the day and you put this, like, really dark blue filter over top of it to make it look like it's nighttime. Um, That's why the lighting's all weird and everything looks kind of odd. Too many giant waves. From my limited surf knowledge, I knew that that first wave shot on the cold opening could only have been filmed in Hawaii. If there were waves like that in North Korea, I know too many surfers that would totally just defect in a heartbeat. Uh, what? So, I mean, this surfing is terrible, you know. Obviously, this must have taken so many takes as well to get this in at dusk. It doesn't look good. It never looks good when they do this. Um, but I guess because it's like some surfing stuff, you really wouldn't be able to shoot this uh, during the nighttime because you wouldn't be able to light it right, and also it's super dangerous to do that. Uh, so um, it's it feels like the least competently made, and I think that's encapsulated at the beginning, where you have a pretty solid cold open. At least what's happening is interesting, but everything about it is so cheesy. You get like the surfing and like the stealth suits, which just right away you're like, Ugh, really, why? I mean, yeah. So it looks weird, and this isn't a great start. The cold open for the credits was actually fantastic, except for the surfing scene. Uh, When Googling the info, I did find it pretty cool that Laird Hamilton was one of the stud surfers. Uh, I mean, if you don't know who he is, Google him. The guy is a beast. I'll definitely be re-watching that opening just to try and see if I can spot which one's him. They're wearing so many clothes that they can't even pull off any sort of decent surfing tricks. Kind of looks like they're meant to be fighting each other. Then they get off at the beach and know they're all working together. I love the idea of Bond sneaking into North Korea, but stealth surfing? You know what? I am kind of sick of skiing scenes. So anyway, there's three surfer dudes. They're shredding sick waves and uh, they're coming into this North Korean base. They're like D-daying on surfboards, which is weird. 
This is the most dull of surfing scenes I've ever seen, but damn if it isn't refreshing for the Bond franchise. Right off the bat, surfing spies? Really? I mean, I guess that works. This is not how you infiltrate a North Korean base. SEALs don't learn this as part of their combat training. You generally like to come in under the water instead of on top of it, just as a rule, just as like kind of a clandestine operations type of thing. Um, generally better to not be seen, uh, not be visible, you know, half a mile out from your, your destination you're supposed to be infiltrating. Seems like they could scuba dive in easier, but whatever. Oh, and one of them's Bond. Okay. Okay. Really? There's some gadgets hidden inside his surfboard, which seems very like a terrible place to hide stuff. It's going to affect, that's going to really badly affect the buoyancy of that surfboard. And then they use this terrible little satellite thing to somehow redirect a helicopter to land near them. Surely the pilot knows it's going to a military base in the no, in like no man's land in North Korea. Why? Why is it just suddenly decide to land like, oh, I'm going to land in this clearing because my, my sat nav in the last two seconds said, oh, yeah, 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 Danny, Danny, please. It's like, oh, come on. So Bond jacks a heli and he lands it in a North Korean base. I'm pretty sure that most C4 isn't packaged in containers that are labeled C4. Then in North Korea... Bond is trying to stop a guy who's uh, selling weapons for diamonds. Um, Bunch of agents jack a helicopter, go to General Moon's base, where Moon pulls out the Zorg ZF-1, my favorite, and blows up the helicopter. Huh. C4 in the watch. I guess that's kind of cool. Um, yeah, and then he blows it up, and it just completely pummels that guy. Is his name Zed or something? <laughs> what a terrible name. So, is this supposed to be like a more badass version of Kim Jong-un? One million landmines and my hovercrafts float right over them. The hovercraft fleet rolls up and you're like, oh yeah, we're definitely going to see something with these guys. I kind of feel like massive hovercrafts would still exert enough pressure to trigger landmines, but what do I know? Um, I'm... I'm not an expert on um, landmines or hovercrafts, but I'm pretty sure a hovercraft would still set off the landmine. Also, this is a real thing. Um, hovercrafts don't set off anti-vehicle mines. They did a whole Mythbusters on it and everything. It doesn't exert the 300 plus pounds of downward force required to set off an anti-vehicle mine. Funny note, they actually tested this concept on Mythbusters to see if a hovercraft could roll over landmines, and they figured out it could be done. Uh, so yeah, you can drive a hovercraft over a landmine uh, built for vehicles, not an anti-personnel mine, and it won't blow the hovercraft up. Um, they did some research on it with the Royal Navy, and they discovered that if you do blow up a mine, if it gave you detonated under a hovercraft, the air cushion actually absorbs most of the blast, um, and it protects the crew and the vehicle from major damage. This is really cool. I didn't know this. I had to look it up for as part of this. I was going to like look up some stuff about how this was totally BS or whatever, but I learned something new today. And he's hiding the weapons. This North Korean uh, colonel, I think, is hiding weapons in the demilitarized zone, which you couldn't do. The demilitarized zone, on top of being full of mines, is also very heavily monitored, so that wouldn't work. But, I mean, I don't know. Bond has his cover blown at the worst possible time, per usual. Oh, God, Bond. Of course they're going to discover who you are in about 30 seconds. Oh, my God. Anyway, Bond gets made like 10 seconds into his mission, which is kind of a thing for him. Um, so he responds by by just detonating the C4 directly into the face of some poor gemologist at point blank range. The North Korean army is using hovercraft so that they can sneak over the landmines on the DMZ. Bond steals a hovercraft. He blows up a Porsche for no reason. He wipes out the entire North Korean base with hovercraft missiles. And then he escapes on the hovercraft. Followed by a great chase scene with the hovercraft. And then... You get the, the hoverboat chase, which a hovercraft chase. I mean, points for originality, I guess, but... Oh, it's just, this is awful. There are too many chase scenes. They're on airboats. There's two different car chases just on ice. The hover vehicle chasing is legit. It's essentially just like, first of all, they're going way too fast for hovercraft. Like those things do not go fast enough to do like triple flips in the air and explode, and knock trees down and plow through concrete walls. They just, they're... It's not what they are. And also, during this whole chase scene, there is no chance in hell that you're going to get that much maneuverability out of a uh, out of a hovercraft. You know, you're just you're just going to blow up. You're going to blow up. 
you know, you're going to hit trees. But, you know, hey, we've seen all kinds of vehicles do all kinds of crazy crap in these last few movies, so why not just double down on it one more time? Throughout this entire sequence, and we will learn for the rest of this movie, um, pretty much anytime you shoot a machine gun and or bump into something a little too hard, uh, it will burst into flames, explode, catapult 50 feet in the air, and do three somersaults, and then explode again when it hits the ground. It is very refreshing to already see some back-to-back brand new things in the franchise, and I'm glad this movie is stretching so much further than the other films in their transportation methods. There's something about this entire sequence that looks weird. I don't know if it's the day for night, I don't know if it's some kind of weird filter they put over top of the, the final product in post, or if it's just that there's like a bunch of green screen or CG going on here. But even though a lot of this is probably seems like it's practical effects, it all looks fake. And I can't really put my finger on why. Yeah. Wait, wait, where did that bell come from? Saved by the bell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, he just made a save by the bell joke. Oh, my God. No, just stop. So, for people who didn't grow up in the 90s, <laughs> Saved by the Spell is an American kids sitcom. I think the bloke's in some sort of lawyer program now. <laughs> and everyone else, I assume, is doing porn. It's, a, it's an okay plot at the start here. It has a lot of potential. What's cool about the cold open is that Bond loses. So then, this movie takes an interesting twist. Like, he gets identified from a blurry cell phone photo, because of course he does, he's James Bond, everybody knows him. Bond is captured and tortured. And then he gets he gets caught by the bad guys and tortured into the theme song. So Bond kills the Kung Fu North Korean samurai armor guy, then he gets grabbed by the North Koreans, and we cut to the intro. It's a torture theme song. But seriously, the opening was great. And then we go into the title sequences. And it's this is by Madonna? Oh my god. I remember this song. Holy smokes, this theme song is so 2000s. I did like the song then, and I still don't mind it now. I hate this song. Oh my god, this is awful. None of this is really working for me. I'm a and of course in this one they're like well we've got to make it worse than the last one so let's get madonna to scream at us for 20 minutes i think it's a clever and unique storytelling method we've got computer generated scorpions which didn't work that well in 3000 miles to graceland it doesn't work that well here we've got a soundtrack by madonna she's got some kind of like dance track here which is not you know what we've seen in this bond movie before it's not the best bond song but it's decent Now, the cameo of Madonna in the movie was weird, but whatever. I'm convinced that her price for, you know, making this stupid song was to be in the movie. Otherwise, why is she running a fencing academy in like a dominatrix? Ah, Ugh, God, this movie's so stupid. I like that they use the opening credits to forward the story. I think that's really neat. That said, I have mixed feelings about the Madonna opening. Uh, the bad? Basically all of it. Oh my God, what is this noise? The, the CG is bad. The opening scene with Bond getting tortured is rough. The CGI in the Scorpions was not the best, but I appreciate it telling a story and not just naked chicks. Speaking of unbelievably ridiculous, can we please, please stop doing these absolutely nonsense intro sequences with terrible CGI and some of the worst songs ever recorded? I mean, there were naked CGI chicks, but that, they were well done to me. Still holds up. Why, why is there scenes of torture going in the background? What? And the visuals of Bond being brutally tortured over the course of days and weeks is, like, completely incongruous with the music that we're listening to. I do want to call out one specific line, though, here. Is she says Sigmund Freud over and over again, and then goes, analyze this. What, what is she talking about? What, what, is, she, is she starting a fight with Sigmund Freud? What does that mean, Madonna? I I don't know uh, uh, if the song really matches it thematically. Like, what's going on here? I just don't understand. Like, in a vacuum, maybe I don't hate this song. And I really don't hate the idea of Bond being stuck in a horrible North Korean prison for an extended period of time. Um, But these two things together just aren't working. The good... There is a short scene where I think they're touching positive and negative leads together to create sparks, and some of those sparks are fire girls. That looks cool. I do like some of the visuals here, with the scorpions, the fire and ice. And the effects, man. It looks and sounds like a wedding videographer put it together. I know that like I've, you've got to give it some slack because this is 2002, but 
man, this does not hold up in 2020. So naturally, of course, the song got nominated for a Golden Globe and two Grammys and charted number one in the United States on Billboard. But, oh, um, oh, the singing. Oh, God, it hurts my ears. Oh, my God, please, somebody, somebody stop this, please. I do like that there's actual plot happening during this because this is like... As well as being a theme song, it's the montage of Bond's torture in North Korean prison for 14 months. Um, he's getting like, he's hallucinating the visuals of the theme song. Ah, that's kind of cool. It's kind of cool. And there's a moment where it looks like there's an angelic figure helping Bond survive. And I like that. This is also the first intro that alludes and directly shows what's happening between the cold intro and the intro of the film. Outside of the books, I think this is the first time we've had a sequence like this. So far in the movies, Bond has been shown as relatively invincible. And this is like one of the first like really stark moments of vulnerability. Pierce Brosnan comes out looking like he just played Jumanji. This movie has James Bond being double-crossed in a mission in North Korea. While he takes out the evil general, he is arrested and imprisoned for 14 months in a North Korean hellhole, eventually being traded for the dead general's henchman. I gotta say, I like seeing Bond with a castaway beard. We cut to Bond looking pretty rough. He's got the long hair, the beard, he's got the Count of Monte Cristo thing going on. It's a departure from what we've seen before, but it's cool. There's, how is Bond's hair that long? It's, it's, it's been like just over a year. There's, there's no way his hair would go from like, you know, his chic quiff that he's got to this long unkept hippie hair like that's the sort of thing you'd get after 14 years of being in captivity it's been 14 months and they couldn't even remove the diamonds from that dude's face rude it's very believable that bond would at some point be captured and have to go through some kind of process like this especially with like a hostile government we've never seen that before in the bond series and i think it's a really interesting concept that is worth exploring and this could be really cool this whole opening really has a lot of potential It's just too bad that the rest of the movie doesn't quite hold up to it. I appreciate the slight joke when Bond was getting looked over with the medical team. They were like, liver not too good. It's definitely him. It ends pretty quickly. Uh, You think Bond's going to be executed by firing squad, but he's not. He is being traded to South Korea in exchange for the dude that got diamonds blasted in his face. Uh, So Bond is freed during a prisoner exchange with Zhao. And I feel like this is kind of a good setup for a, like a one last mission kind of movie because Bond was fully ready to die for his country. They weren't going to get anything out of him and he's he's angry about being traded for Zhao. So M rescues Bond but locks him up at the same time because apparently he was leaking information. Of course, this is Bond. He's not leaking information. He's just grown a lot of hair at an in a, in a human rate. Bond ultimately gets extracted because he was set up to get caught in North Korea, and then he's also been set up so that MI6 thinks he's broken under torture, basically. But he didn't. So he's like, it's the same person set me up twice. I gotta go get him. And M's like, nah, man, you're done. Double O status rescinded. So Bond once again goes rogue. The, the whole idea of Bond being betrayed by his own country, being captured by the People's Republic of Korea being put into like a prison camp and tortured for a year and some change is an interesting, if nothing else, way to open the Bond film or a Bond film. The problem is pretty much everything that happens after that. I'm in a glass cage of emotion. Let me out, M, please. And uh, yeah, so he decides to break himself out and go find out what the f*** is going on. As you do. Yeah, good on you, Bond. Good work, mate. Bond's reaction to being freed was one of the best parts of this movie. When M says, you know the deal, you had your cyanide, and James is like, threw it out years ago. That shows you how he really feels what this job was. So Bond gives himself a heart attack to get the doctors to come in so that he can knock the doctor out and then just jump off the boat and swim to Hong Kong like a boss. It's actually really convenient that Bond is recovering in a hospital aboard that derelict ship in the middle of the Hong Kong Bay. Bond then has to escape from Her Majesty's own Navy in Hong Kong Harbor, setting off a chain of events that really doesn't slow down at any one point. Except for a very, very odd scene in the middle of the movie, where Bond gets to test out VR training simulator based on the attack on MI6, which seems so out of place it's disconcerting, like it's not even the same movie. 
And then when he gets to Hong Kong, he walks into a hotel totally drenched in hospital clothes and is like, hey, give me the presidential suite. I love that moment where he strolls into the hotel lobby and just expects service. Bond wasn't up to his best in this movie, but him walking dirty and disgusting into a five-star hotel, being recognized by the manager and just being like, set me up. That's great. And one of the guys there, the concierge or whatever, is like, oh, Mr. Bond, of course, of course, of course. Bond escapes from the hospital and wanders into the lobby of a five-star hotel dressed like a wet hobo. Um, And they give him a bottle of expensive champagne, 24 brand new shirts, an electric razor, and a prostitute. Money notes. The bottle of 1961 Bollinger that James orders in Hong Kong goes for about $1,100 today. Although it's getting up there in age and it might not taste that great. But turns out that guy's Chinese intelligence. But oh yeah, this prostitute's a spy and he doesn't get fooled by it. I think this is like the first time in the history of James Bond when um, he wasn't completely taken by the girl who was actually a spy. Of course they're Chinese spies in the hotel. <laughs> I actually quite like this bit of the ashtray. <laughs> but yeah, he you know just casually sexually assault the woman coming up to give you a massage, throw an ashtray in the mirror and go, hey, you're all Chinese agents. And Bond's like, hey, listen, you know that Zhao guy, Korean dude, assholes, got diamonds in his face? You hate him, and I hate him. How about you help me go kill him? So now Bond's working with Chinese intelligence instead of British intelligence. Now, get me some clothes. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> now get me a plane ticket somewhere else, please. Ah, thank you. For, thank, thank you, Chinese government. Very welcome. So Chinese intelligence gives Bond tickets to Havana. Another great thing in the movie was Bond showing up in Cuba to meet up with a sleeper agent. Next up, Bond's off to Cuba. It's like he's going on a grand tour of all the countries that have uh, very strange relations with the United States. (laughs) This is the way Bond films used to work with. He would work with locals, people who lived near where the action was that were knowledgeable. But uh, he finds an old informant and uh, gets a car. I like the 57 Fairlane, and I love the mariachi version of the Bond theme that keeps coming up when he's in Cuba. I think that's a really, really cool thing. After getting some information from his contact in China, Bond goes to Cuba after Zhao, where he meets Jinx. I also like that he orders a mojito instead of the martini. It's like going in Rome, you know? Bond ends up going to Cuba on the Chinese intelligence recommendation. There's a strange clinic that expands your life expectancy in Cuba, and Zhao's apparently scheduled to be there. But before he goes and checks out the clinic, he does have to have just some quick sex with Halle Berry, who plays Jinx in this movie. Um, Now this is messed up, man. Bond is so, so much older than Halle Berry. And now we get Halle Berry, fresh off of her Academy Award the year before, but still a couple years until everybody lost any respect for her when she did Catwoman. Yeah, it's it's kind of cute how they meet each other. They immediately start flirting and hook up. My friends call me James Bond is a bad pickup line. The chemistry here isn't working for me. These lines are all bad. The dialogue's all bad. I don't like it. I don't believe it's that easy to pick up Halle Berry. I don't think any of these cheesy jokes even make sense in context with one another, let alone, um, you know, in the context of a larger conversation. The close-up on Halle when she says, until dawn, is very disturbing. I feast like there's no tomorrow. My skin crawls just saying it out loud. And this is just such a weird, creepy chat-up scene between the two of them they're like both i don't know it's weird i think bond had more chemistry with the hooker masseuse spy girl um and i think halle berry had more chemistry with benjamin bratt and catwoman oh halle berry what what happened to you where is your career still going i don't i don't hear much about you anymore like you seem to have won an oscar and then i think you won an oscar and then i remember you uh, you got half naked in swordfish and then you seem to have done this film and Catwoman, and I think it may have destroyed your career. So, sorry about that, you know, you, you were good in Monster, but yeah, sorry Halle Berry, shouldn't have done this bill. And then, at the clinic, we end up seeing that Halle Berry is a super cool spy too. I mean, you know, we're going to find out in a bit that Halle Berry is a bit more than what she seems, but... <laughs> oi, oi. Uh, but, yeah, it's just like, this is really creepy. And I'm pretty sure Pierce Brosnan's got loads of, like, you know, just the men in his hair, you know. He's getting close to his, like, Mamma Mia days now. He's got a bit of a dad bod as well, I noticed earlier. So, yeah, there's that. The homage to Honey Rider with Jinx coming out of the water was great. Her outfit was on point, and she hidden had the knife. Oh, I hate the way Halle Berry tries to reenact the scene from the very first film, Doctor No, because she just doesn't pull it off and does this really weird sort of hip wiggle. It looks like she's trying to sort of shake the water off her hips as she's going, and it's just just not good. Uh, and she's 
a, once again, a more competent spy than Bond is. I don't know how Bond has the reputation he does, because it seems like every other spy that he encounters, especially if they're a woman, is a better spy than he is. Jinx is an American agent with the NSA, played by Halle Berry. Once again, it's just unfortunate that it's not a better movie, but she is definitely not the problem with it. And then goes off to some island where people are having weird gene therapy, which we'll find out more about. Bond tracks Jinx to the genetics lab where he finds Zhao. So Bond tracks Jinx to some weird Andromeda strain underground gene replacement lab where there's like just weird stuff coming over on the intercoms. They don't ever explain why or what that is, uh, but it's it's creepy. This DNA doctor reminds me so much of Steinman from Bioshock. Like I don't think this is a thing. Like I don't think you. Oh no, they're doing face off. They are gonna do face off. Oh man. Hey, look, it's the man from Del Monte. Oh, no, wait, it's just uh, Zed. He's got diamonds stuck in his face. So it looks like he's got uh, Del Monte's face. He's been bejazzled. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, he proceeds to just kick the crap out of Bond. You know, he definitely kicks the crap out of Bond. And we even have a like an odd foot chase through the Cuban clinic. Runs away from him. There's all explosions and shit. He gets away in a helicopter. You know, I bet that Nokia phone used as a bomb survived the explosion. Okay, look, this is kind of a stupid nitpick because we're just doing you know, gene replacement face-off kind of stuff here. But if you're going to do dramatic facial and body modification, reconstruction, reconstructive surgery, wouldn't you remove the chunks of diamond in your face before you'd worry about stuff like changing the eye color and lightening your skin? Like, like, wouldn't you remove the one defining characteristic of your character? Seems like that would be the first thing you'd want to get surgically removed. Halle Berry's running around shooting him and then does a really weird Lara Croft like swan dive off of the mountain cliff and gets in a boat and goes away all cocksure just like this this place would definitely have enough resources to deal with Halle Berry I'm sorry but it just would it just it just would as Jinx and James are attacking the copter I'm made to wonder how they ended up on opposite sides of it when they were clearly in the same spot just a second ago I'm not rewatching this to figure it out and unfortunately Zhao escapes Back in London, Bond investigates Gustav Graves. Um, he's got uh, his initials on the diamonds that Zhao's uh, uh, clinic bill is being paid for. Um, so that's uh, the lead here. London Calling is a weird musical transition here. I thought we were going to Iceland. And isn't Bond supposed to be incognito? Why is he parachuting in with a British flag like into Buckingham Square? Oh, okay. This isn't Bond. This is Captain Flint from Black Sails. Okay, I'm a photographer, so this is a personal funny. After Graves skydives in, then drives off, the camera focuses on Bond. The kid standing next to him has his right hand appropriately gripping the camera and shutter button. His left hand is also on the body, but it's flat and vertical. How did they manage to hire the one extra that doesn't know how to hold a camera? And why did they keep him in that shot? Bond eventually makes his way back to England where he gets into a random sword fight with this guy named Gustav Graves. So Mr. Graves is basically just Richard Branson. Sword fight scene! And Bond ends up getting to a fencing fight with Gustav Graves. Yay, fencing. The world's most exciting sport. Um, that or scuba diving. In the scene, we meet Miranda uh, Frost, who is Gustav's assistant. Yeah, who's the blonde lady? And we also meet Madonna as a fencing instructor. Oh, cool. They let Madonna act in this one. That's a weird poll, but all right. Is that Madonna? I don't know who that is. Who is that? Someone tell me. I never thought I'd have to say this. There's just a lot of sword fights in this movie. And I did appreciate the sword fighting slash fencing part of the movie. And looking back, you have to remember that Graves is actually Moon and hates Bond. That's just a guy being rude to Bond. I don't think that is Richard E. Grant. <laughs> I think this is supposed to be the bad guy. And yeah, I might have just completely misremembered this with like a film like called Spy Kids or something. I don't know. That seems like the more sort of thing where Richard E. Grant would be a bad guy. Mm, my, my, my mistake. We meet with Donna, and then she introduces us to Graves and Frost and their sword fighting. First blood drawn from the torso. I love that. That is a great, like, that is a great stipulation for, like, if we are going to have a duel, first blood drawn from the torso. I love it. This is great. While the actual combat of it is straight bad cutting, pun intended, the traveling scenes as the characters move within and between spaces are really fun. Is this... Is this sword fight still going on? 
I don't know enough to say that neither actor knows how to handle a blade, but the camera didn't know what to focus on. This is the most British fight sequence I have ever seen, so it's perfect that it's in a James Bond movie. This fencing scene's pretty cool. It's a fun action scene. They go from, like, straight regulation fencing to pulling swords off the wall and getting into a sword fight that goes across the club and they destroy the whole place. And also, this is really dangerous. Get out of the room. Like, <laughs> honestly, people, come on, use your head. I love how these guys are just, like, kicking each other's ass and everybody is just standing around. All the other fencing people are just standing around like, what the f Should we do something in the middle of this? I mean, surely everyone else in this, like, you know, fencing club would be like, what the f*** are you two doing? Why have you taken your shirts off and your protective gear and you're fighting with two swords? I, I imagine it's like if Michael Jordan decided to play one-on-one -on -one with hand grenades. And then Graves and Bond sword fight through, like, the entire building destroying half the things in it. Well, no, the blonde girl stopped it. Thank God for that. Pretty cool. Why? Why is no one in this place pissed off about this huge sword fight? It's just destroyed half the club. It just baffles me. So, in theory, I actually kind of like Graves as a character. I think they went a little too over the top with him, but he actually reminds me a lot of Sir Hugo Drax from the book Moonraker, not the movie, who was a secret Nazi villain masquerading as a British icon. He's being played by Toby Stevens, and over the last few years, the BBC has been doing radio dramatizations of all the Bond novels, and he has been playing Bond in all of them. Um, they're actually great if you like old-timey radio kind of stuff, radio audio drama kind of things. They're all up on YouTube. I think they're up to Man with the Golden Gun right now, but they're great, and he is great as Bond. It's also clever that Graves is kind of a parody of Bond. He's basically an evil version of, like, Roger Moore's Bond. <laughs> Okay, so Graves and Bond cause about a billion dollars of property damage. They destroy a bunch of, like, historical artifacts. They horrify half of London. They beat the shit out of each other incessantly for, like, ten minutes, punch each other in the face a dozen times, and it still ends in a draw. This is great. I love this fight. I think it's my favorite fight sequence of the entire movie. Uh, really well done. Really, like, intense. Uh, cool. I like the way they're going back and forth. This is my favorite fight of the, of the movie. So after Bond and Graves make total jackasses of themselves, Bond goes to meet with M in secret in an underground tunnel base. Ooh, a mysterious giant old key, which could definitely open a lock which would be easily lockpicked. <laughs> Bond ends up in this secret area under Westminster Bridge, and this is a really cool setup. I don't know if this is an old World War II, like, you know, something from the Blitz or something, but it's cool. I do like, though, at the end of this, though, Bond gets a conspicuous key that takes him to a door next to the Thames, and he goes underground to uh, an abandoned train station. Oh, and it opens a door uh, to somewhere where I've been, which is just on the side of the embankment in London, which, you know, has millions of tourists walking past it all day long. Yeah, that's a thing. I love the framing of M and the tunnel doorway, and I wonder if there's supposed to be a metaphor for the signs. Bond beneath the way out sign and M beneath the no exit sign. Hmm. I love M. She has been consistently great through the entirety of the Brosnan movies, um, even as these movies tend to like vary and fluctuate wildly in quality. She is like a constant good part of them. Bond calls it an abandoned station for abandoned agents. I'd hope never to find myself here. And basically, M is like, listen, you're blacklisted right now. We can't be helping you. But we're going to help you by hooking you up with Q and a new car and all kinds of fun stuff. 